I hope uh, Dr. Adriana Lopez, um, she is going to uh, join us from CDC with updates on enterovirus circulation, and then we'll have a talk about how we're preparing, where are the resources, where to call in the middle of the night when you get that, that call that there is a child with flaccid limb in the ER. Dr. Lopez. Thank you, Dr. Stasky. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for making the time in this um, schedule, this great um, symposium today, for me to provide an update on what we're seeing with regards to enterovirus circulation and AFM cases. So at the end of August, CDC started hearing about clusters of respiratory illness in a few different locations. Um, specimens from these patients were enterovirus, rhinovirus positive, and in one of the locations, they were actually able to type and found that some of them were EVD68 positive. So we don't have systematic nationwide surveillance for EVD68 and enteroviruses, but we do have our new vaccine surveillance network, or NVSN, which um, conducts pediatric surveillance for EVD68 among children presenting with acute respiratory illness, or ARI, um, who are receiving care in the emergency department or inpatient units at seven distinct sites. So looking first at the EVD68 ARI data from NVSN, we have seen a notable rise in recent months. So in the yellow box, um, we have the data for March through August of this year. Um, and we have detected EVD68 in 84 children across five sites. So this is already more detections than has been observed in 2019 through 2021 combined. So based on these data, we're anticipating that this year could be a high year for EVD68 circulation. But I do want to point out that these data are very preliminary and testing is still ongoing, so it's not complete just yet. But we know from our experience in 2014 that an increase in AFM cases followed an increase in EVD68 positive respiratory cases by about one to two weeks. And we track AFM activity by the number of reports of suspected cases that we receive from health departments. So these are not confirmed cases, but they're reports of suspected cases that CDC receives for review and classification. And this is, excuse me, this is as close to real-time activity tracking as we have. So the peak year report averages are shown by the blue line. Reports for 2021 are shown by the yellow line and reports for 2022 are shown by the red line. As you can see here, the red line is now following the trajectory of the line for our peak years, which um, has us a little worried. So in response, we're um, working with our jurisdiction partners to provide them with um, a template of a health advisory that they can send out to their clinicians and have the, their clinicians report directly to them. But we're also partnering with the AFM working group um, and the clinical community to help um, us, whoops, sorry, <laughs> to help increase awareness as much as possible. So finally, I just want to show our epidemiologic curve of our confirmed cases since 2014. Um, so far in 2022, we've only had 13 confirmed cases reported to CDC. Um, but based on what we're seeing with EVD68 circulation, it remains to be seen what happens. So we are definitely on high alert. Um, and it's great to be able to partner with such a wonderful clinical community to help ensure that the patients with AFM are recognized early and that they receive the best possible care. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so very much. Um, uh, thank you, Samash, and thank you, Samash Adriana, for this uh, update. Uh, there are some questions already in the chats. The first, can you speak about the regional pattern of 
EV D68 detections in the NS and NVSN 2022 example. Where has been it been? Where is it now? Uh, what is being reported with regards to asthma-like respiratory disease, patient volumes, uh, since most of the uh, cannot test it uh, clinically? Um, we're still looking at the data. There has been increases in um, severe disease, so some um, asthma-like acerbations, but um, I would have to circle back with our NVSN partners to make sure that I'm... Um, giving the correct information, um, but they are preparing an MMWR to describe what's going on. And that is hopefully gonna come out at the end of September to summarize the data that they have so far. Um, in terms of regional patterns, it's pretty much in different areas of the country. So um, we have some sites in the Midwest. Um, I think um, Nashville had some, New York had some, um, I think in Kansas City as well, those are some of the sites that have seen increases in cases. Now, in terms of AFM, is there any, I mean, what is your, uh, your sense that is going on in August? Is, is this unusual to have an increased number of cases or is this a little bit out of the trend that you were expecting? So in terms of reports of possible AFM cases in the past, since 2018, after 2018, actually, we haven't seen this bump that I showed you that red line um, increasing like it has this year. So it has us a little concerned because that's what we would normally see during our peak years when we're about to see a large number of cases. And, um, you know, in 2019 was a non-peak year, 2020, we were expecting to see a lot of cases, but then because of COVID and the non-pharmaceutical interventions that were implemented likely disturbed circulation of respiratory viruses. So we weren't sure what was going to happen after that. And 2021 ended up being a low year. So it is, um, it is a little concerning to see the increase in reports that we've gotten which has put us on higher alert. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there is another question from uh, 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 Matt Bogd at UNC. How quickly will the sample sent to the CDC for typing to specifically identify ED68 or A71, for example, be returned to a clinician? It usually takes um, about five business days for them to get the results back. And what happens is, the specimen needs to be sent to the health department, the, to the state public health lab. That lab will send it to CDC and then it, the tests are run and then the results are reported back to the state public health lab. And so then the um, health department will follow up with the lab and report the results back to the clinician. So that's a very helpful information. And uh, one thing that is very frequent, particularly among clinicians, is uh, the question about when to report a case uh, of AFM and where, I mean, what are the resources available for that? Do you mind clarifying? So what is the approach to notify CDC about uh, uh, suspected cases of AFM? Sure. Um, thank you. So what we ask you to do is if if you're a clinician and you see a patient who has acute onset of flaccid limb weakness and there are some MRI gray matter changes in their spinal MRI, um, then we ask that you um, contact your health department first um, so that the health department is aware and then they will work with you to figure out what information is needed. So generally we'll ask for a patient summary form to be completed and the health department folks can work with you to do that. And then there's, we request the MRI reports, a neurology consult note, and then the MRI images, because that information is what is collected and sent to our neurology panel for their review and classification. And we have on our website um, resources where you can go to find the contacts for your health department. Also, we, you can email afminfo at cdc.gov to find out specific contacts at the health department as well. Uh, so I will take this opportunity just to uh, uh, update the group and the attendees of this uh, virtual symposium about the acute flaxemylitis working group. 
Uh, and again, this is a multidisciplinary group that is focused on helping uh, families and the community affected by acute flux myelitis. And it's a very important uh, resource for healthcare providers. Uh, the F AFM Working Group has a website that has a lot of information about acute flux myelitis, not only from uh, uh, acute diagnosis, but also uh, long-term management. One thing that uh, I will emphasize that the group is a multicentric group that has different sites around the country uh, uh, and also partners in different uh, countries around the world, including Europe, uh, uh, India, uh, uh, Japan, uh, Africa, and South America. And many of these uh, partners actually are collaborating actively in uh, programs of uh, research and uh, clinical work. But uh, since uh, Adriana is updating us about what is going on epidemiologically with AFM, uh, we want to update you on the program that we have uh, implemented as a possible response to uh, cases of acute flux in my life. So we are partnering with SRNA, the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association, and uh, the CDC. Uh, the, uh, it, there is an AFM phys physician portal that is available uh, to everybody around the country and families, as well as uh, physicians and healthcare providers. Uh, uh, and that portal actually uh, is a very good way to triage questions to different uh, ex experts in acute flux and myelitis. Uh, again, if you are looking for the AFM portal for physicians and healthcare providers, what you can do is Google AFM portal, and you are going to be basically uh, in the environment of the SRNA website when there is a form that is going to be filled, uh, and the form is directed to either medical professionals or for families and caregivers. And that form uh, contains basic information of the person who is uh, basically generating the question, but the most important is uh, to uh, ask questions that are related uh, with AFM from medical point of view, uh, therapy, or uh, family uh, resources. So uh, I um, basically am providing this information so you can take advantage of this uh, 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 resource that is facilitated by our uh, colleagues and partner at the SRNA and the staff from SRNA is uh, basically uh, receiving this information and, and there is a group of fellows and, and providers at the AFM working group that are going to be uh, answering those questions and facilitating those responses. And at the same time, I'd like to remind you that the National Institute of Health, uh, the NIAD, Acute Flux in My Life is Natural History Study uh, 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 is basically based around the country as well as uh, uh, United Kingdom and Peru. And there are several sites around the country that are basically ready to uh, uh, recruit patients that have been diagnosed recently with acute flux and myelitis. And again, if you need any information about this, please uh, let us know because that is a very important resource for um, everybody. So uh, I will stop uh, uh, here, but I will, uh, uh, continue asking some of the questions for Adriana. Adriana, uh, there is a, a, a lot of interest in the uh, clinical community about the uh, expansion of uh, biological sample collections in uh, sites or places that are not associated with the uh, 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 NIH study. Do you mind expanding and clarifying what are the uh, resources uh, that uh, CDC may have for uh, those biological samples? Sure. So we um, have partnered um, or contracted out with a clinical research organization who is working with hospitals that are outside of the NIH enrolled hospitals. So if a patient presents to one of those hospitals, um, we let the, our clinical research organization know as long as the health department gets permission to um, contact the clinician, our clinical research organization will reach out 
to the clinician, ask if the patient is interested in um, participating, collect specimens, and those specimens will then be sent to a biorepository, which can then at a later time be used by researchers. So there's there will be a process for accessing those samples for research, but it will be um, proposals can be written and then they would be accessed. So it's through our clinical research organization that that possibility is available. Uh, there is a, a, another question that uh, is probably very important for uh, clinicians and, and scientists that are, are doing research. And, and uh, there is a lot of interest in many laboratories about the samples that have been submitted to uh, CDC that may be available later for other type of research activities. So what is the mechanism that the CDC may have for researchers that may like to get access to those biological samples? What is the uh, uh, mechanism that is used for that? Um, that, if they're sent for diagnostic purposes, then it would have to be requested back. So whoever is submitting the um, specimens would have to request the specimens back and then they would go back to whoever requested and then, then they could work to do research on those specimens. But if they're sent for biological or biological testing, that's how we would do it. It's different for the clinical research organization, which was set up specifically for that. Um, thank you, Adriana. Uh, there is another question that is important, particularly because we have a, an international audience here. Uh, we have our colleagues from Netherlands, from UK, France, uh, attending this symposium. So they are very interested in learning what is the potential partnership for international surveillance of enterovirus that may be uh, uh, coordinated with the CDC? What, are, what resources are available and what will be the mechanisms for that? Um, we started reaching out. One thing that we did was we held a panel at the International um, Conference on Emerging Infectious Diseases. That was one way where we got some um, collaborators together. We're thinking about getting um, doing a more um, um, systematic meeting with everybody, maybe quarterly to discuss, um, get discussions going, find out what different um, regions are, how they're doing surveillance for enteroviruses and possibly acute flaccid myelitis. So we've kind of started it. It's kind of stalled on our end because we're dealing with the polio response and now with the uptick in AFM. So, um, but we do plan to continue communicating with our colleagues, particularly in UK and Netherlands. Um, and then, there's also going to be another um, webinar on um, wastewater surveillance. So there's different things that we're working with and communicating with each other to increase that collaboration. So Adriana, you brought a very hot topic uh, for virologists and epidemiologists is the water, uh, uh, water surveillance. Uh, do you mind expanding what are the uh, plans that the CDC has for the future, uh, not only in the United States, but uh, collaboration with other countries on uh, 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 sewage surveillance. So currently our thoughts right now are, um, we had talked about possibly doing some wastewater surveillance for enteroviruses, specifically enterovirus D68, to see if that could possibly be some kind of alert for you know increasing circulation of EVD68 and possibly for AFM. Um, but then we and we this is where that um, webinar with our um, European colleagues who are doing and wastewater surveillance for enteroviruses came about. So we wanted to talk with them and get their experience and see if that could be expanded here in the US. Um, while that was going on, we had the detection of the polio case in New York, and um, that has led to targeted wastewater surveillance for polio virus. Um, we've been doing it solely in New York region right now, but we're talking about expanding it to different areas in the U.S., focusing more on areas with low vaccination coverage and um, risk for importation of polio. So this would be specific for polio virus. So that's where we are right now. We're um, starting to look at different sites um, to see if we can do that. But then there's the issues 
there's containment issues if polio virus is detected. So there's different things that need to be taken into account that we're um, in the process of working on. So thank you, Adriana. And so again, you are bringing up very interesting topics and uh, about polio. So uh, is there any other approach that the CDC has or may have in the future for uh, surveillance of uh, circulation of uh, polio in the United States? The uh, wastewater approach is obviously a, a very interesting approach, but is there any other potential approach that you may use in the future for polio surveillance? Um, right now, the, the approach that we've been using is our AFM surveillance. So um, as you all know, clinically AFM and polio look similar. So, um, and the New York case actually came through us through AFM surveillance. So we plan to continue and we're emphasizing um, stool collection for cases, um, suspected AFM cases, because until we can rule out polio in their stool, they could be polio. So um, we're trying to improve our AFM surveillance to ensure that we're able to capture, you know, possible polio cases. And then just looking at seeing how um, the wastewater surveillance works. Um, we may select pilot sites and see how that goes, um, depending on what we find and how that works, then that may be expanded, but we're in the early planning stages right now. So those, the surveillance, the clinical surveillance, and then the wastewater is what we're looking at right now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Adriana, for all of this information. And again, we appreciate very much the partnership with all of our colleagues at the CDC, not only epidemiology, but also virology, immunology, diagnosis, who are doing a, a, a great uh, work uh, trying to understand all of these emerging uh, infectious disorders. Uh